Hello, everybody. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies. But I have a very, very special guest today in studio, Miles Wickham. Look at this. I'm so yeah. glad that you're here. Thank this you is so much. so much fun. Cool. It, it feels a whole lot more normal than things have felt recently. We've all lived in the Zoom void. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So nice to not be in it. You know, part of what I like so much about what you do is the audience that you speak to and how you just get really basic. Mm -hmm. Because the further we are away from good money, the further people are away from understanding the real function of money. Mm -hmm. That it is really about you're trading your labor for this but it's not designed to hold value over time. So the longer you hold it, then the less you actually get paid for your money. Right. But, you know, I wanted to talk about some things, and you wanted to talk about them too, where we have a lot of commonality. Because we are definitely both what would be considered contrarians. Yeah. So could you explain a little bit more about that for our viewers? Yeah, to be honest with you, I don't think I ever really knew what the term contrarian meant. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was something that I came from, a, a, I come from Australia originally, I come from a different background. I didn't follow the same social path that most uh, people in the United States, have, and for that matter, many other countries in the Western world follow. I didn't even finish high school. I went straight into business. Um, mm. But during the process of doing it, I had this association with money for what it was and or for what it is and uh, I also had these constant questions in the back of my mind what is the context of it why am I spending all of my waking hours pursuing this what's mm -hmm. the point what, what's the, the the answer to the why was never really properly uh, answered for me so what ended up happening was uh, you go through life and you have different adventures and misadventures and things happen to you and I looked at everybody around me and I looked at their experiences and when I came to the United States when I was about 25 I came up close and personal with people who had a very different background to me and a very different shall we call it pre-programming of how mm -hmm. they wanted to live their life and when I tried to find common ground and speak to people that you know I was meeting it was like this <laughs> <laughs> I and know I, that feeling really know that well. Feeling. Absolutely. And, and I guess that's why I call myself a contrarian these days because I've never been able, I, I've never really found too many people. You're an exception, and there, there's a few others, but I don't find too many people out there who went down the rabbit hole of that social mm -hmm. programming mm -hmm. and then said, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> right. This, this doesn't, doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. Right. Right. Um, and pulled themselves out of it and then found what was really going on. Mm -hmm. And then, and that journey is fascinating to me. I, I'm, I'm curious about how that happened for you. Well, uh, you know what? I, I don't know that I've ever really thought about it other than to say that I never really took anything at face value. And so, you know, I would just ask a lot of questions. And especially, I think, you know, I, I don't know. I can't really answer that, actually, to tell you the truth, Miles, because... But you've seen both sides, right? You had a career. Oh, absolutely. I had a career in banking. Right, and right. It, You know, may, maybe it was, you know, I, I started out at Shearson. That's where I started my stockbrokering career. And, you know, you first get out. They've got a phenomenal training program. But they didn't really teach you how to read the technical language of the markets. What they taught you was how to sell an intangible, and mm -hmm. that was really the focus. But I never thought that that's why people were hiring me, to just parrot back what they were telling me. I thought they were hiring me to understand what, you know, I had to have an understanding of the markets and everything. And I remember they told me to do something, and I, and I just did it. But then it didn't work the way they said that it would. And then they came back and said, well, talk to your clients because they're here because of you. And I thought, yeah, no. So I started really questioning. 
And at that period of time as well, this was in the 80s, you could call and talk to the head of any department that you wanted to. So as I was learning and trying to understand the markets and then really, I don't know, I stumbled across non-dollar denominated bonds, funny enough. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, New Zealand bonds and Australian bonds and Canadian bonds, but mostly, mostly New Zealand and then secondarily Australian. And that was all about currencies. And when you start to actually study currencies, and then you look at these patterns, these patterns that repeat time after time. I mean, I, I can't really tell you exactly why or how I became a contrarian, but I know that I research a lot. Mm -hmm. And then I form an opinion. And then I run with that opinion until yeah. something says, oh, you need to change your opinion. So I guess it's probably pertinent to define contrarian in context of money because we, right. we look to alternative assets, alternative investments that are not mainstream. They're not the 401k, IRA, pension type assets. These are, these are things that are odd and alternative and they often do better in bear markets. Oh, well, absolutely. You know, in, in that regard, I mean, I'm so grateful I was at Shearson at the time that I was, because honestly, had I not stumbled across non-dollar denominated bonds, and then I spent like a year and a half starting every morning with the head of currency trading, but then I, I started to see that, that it was really a product. And I think what was helpful for me was at that period of time, that's also when they were establishing globalization. And a lot of what they were saying just didn't make sense to me, right? right? But I had a very brilliant woman that I could bounce things off of that was honest, and she did help me make sense of it. So to me, I, I know Wall Street wants you to think of gold as an alternative asset class, mm -hmm. but gold is the oldest and the only surviving asset right. class. Right. So it's actually far more traditional. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you should say that. I, I, uh, I think it was about 2016, I found myself with my family um, in Venice, Italy. Mm -hmm. And I had studied some work of, I think it was Neil Ferguson, uh, one of the mm -hmm. economists out of Yes, the I like him very much. Yes. And, and he had told, he was telling a story about the history of money, like where money came from. Not so much money, but more banking, financial mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. And he spoke about this town square in this area of Venice called the Caraneggio. It's the Jewish ghetto area. Mm -hmm. I've and been there. Yes. And I've I, been there, actually. I went there specifically to stand in that town square mm -hmm. to kind of take it in because there's nothing there. It's just this nondescript, right. boring place, right? But it's where banking began. And when you start understanding why... And the fact that, really, we wouldn't even have a financial services industry if it wasn't for contrarians. Right. Because the, the truth was that in those days, back in 1100 or so, when uh, Italy was run, or the Mediterranean, the world's economy, effectively, was run under strict Catholic law, there was no ability for anybody to loan under the Christian doctrine and charge interest. Right. And so you had farmers on the mainland of Italy who were unable to buy seed to grow crop to feed the town of Venice, and somebody had to come up with a solution. And of course, it came from the Jewish people who said, well, we don't sign up for that. We can't charge interest to a, to a Gentile who wants to borrow from us. And so they created the world's first banks. And as a result, we have a financial services industry. And if only the world was as simple as that today. Oh, no, no. Yeah, that would <laughs> we'd, be amazing. We'd have a chance no. at this, right? But it's been distorted. The second we lost mm -hmm. gold as a standard, we distorted mm -hmm. everything. Math mm -hmm. doesn't make sense anymore. And most of my career has been in software technology and, and building systems for people. And I see the way that systems have enslaved us in so many right. different levels. Uh, but particularly when numbers is used as a basis, uh, a, a digital measurement of something in that world, uh, we are rife for further 
enslavement in this. So I, I'm 100% on board with, let's go back to the old ways. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get to go back to the old ways, no. except the individual can go back to the old ways and make sure that they're protected with the gold. Mm -hmm. Because that's really what it is. You know, I mean, it, it, it serves many functions. It's functional across every aspect of the global economy. But for me, the most important function is for it to hold your wealth intact hold its purchasing power intact over time. So can you speak to that a little bit more? Well, absolutely. I, I, the problem we've got right now is a, is a market since the 70s, which has been boom-bust cycle, constant boom-bust cycle. Mm -hmm. I feel so sorry for somebody who is, let's say, in their 60s and has worked their entire life for company X or whatever, and they're looking at this, they're, they're like, uh, anxiety is massive because they don't know at any point in time when the market is going to go down or up at the time when they want to get off the train, right? right. When they want to retire. Right. And if they retire when the market crashes, they've lost all value for their final quarter in life, and it's not it's not good. Uh, they need something which will counterbalance this dysfunctional economy that we've built that has just, maybe it's organic, maybe it's by design, but it just feels like we need a counterbalance. If you don't have it, you need something that's gonna go up in value when the dollar goes down or when the market's turned down, we want something that holds its value. And for me, I, I couldn't see a better counterbalance than gold. Well, I mean, some might not like me to bring this up, but you know, as somebody that has built systems out, what do you think of the cryptocurrencies? Well, can that do that? No. I did very well out of Bitcoin, I, I must admit, um, because I got into it when it was 2011. But the reason why I did very well, because it, it, maybe it was by luck, maybe it was by happenstance, but I was looking for something that was a medium of exchange. Mm -hmm. I had a guy working for me who was in Bangladesh. I couldn't wire him money inexpensively. I couldn't PayPal him. I couldn't do... I had to go to... MoneyGram Western Union and lose 27% of everything he had earned wow. to pay him. And I was, and, and, and this was at a time, I guess it was in the late 2000s, um, this was at a time when we were post 9-11, there was this general social culture against uh, Muslim countries, right. and he had lived in one of those, and so there, it was impossible to send money to him. And yet he was an incredibly great worker and a really smart guy. I, uh, I used Bitcoin to achieve that, and that came because of various different um, suggestions by different people in the market that this was the only way I could actually get money from me to him. Mm -hmm. If those days were still true, I would be absolutely 100% bullish on that currency. The problem is, as of about 2017, um, no one wanted to spend, spend their Bitcoin anymore because they could just see this thing going up and up and up and up. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it's not a medium of exchange because it cost uh, up to $50 to do a transaction back then. I think a lot of pain less at Western Union. Or, uh, and today, even I think the average rate of uh, a transaction is somewhere around 10. And yes, there are alternative ways to use this that might allow it to become a medium of exchange, but no one wants to spend their Bitcoin. Well, do you think part of that has to do with Wall Street's involvement? It, Wall Street has a funny sort of five stages of grief <laughs> relationship with Bitcoin, right? The first is to deny it and to freak out, and eventually they come to the point of acceptance and embracement, and now they want to take ownership of it. Um, so for people that think that it's out of the system, what do you think about that? Uh, no, it's not out of the system. When, when the price of it is manipulated by large-scale institutional investment, it's no different than, than bidding up a stock or, or using media spin to drop a stock value. It's just, it's, it's got the same, it's just another asset class that will be affected by the exact same human behavior that's always been there in Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And unless it is truly the people's currency, uh, I don't honestly believe that that's an option. To me, holding physical gold um, seems a little safer. If you look at the actual rate of, of up and down flow of things like Bitcoin over, say, the last five years, and you compare that with gold, 
when it's up, everybody's you know cheering for its support and, and saying it's a wonderful thing. When it's down, they don't want to know. They don't want to know it. You, mm -hmm. if, you know, if you put context on there, talk to somebody in 2017 who bought Bitcoin at twenty thousand and then watched it go to three. Mm -hmm. Their position on Bitcoin is not going to be the same as somebody who bought it at three and it went to twenty thousand. Right. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. So there, there's, and this is one of the things that um, I I find myself I wouldn't say critical, but questioning why people don't understand that the nature of the balance of our universe of everything is to counterbalance positive with negative, north mm -hmm. with south, true with false, right with left. It's in physics it's all around us and takes us back to the contrarian point of view as well exactly right and, and I, I I talk about a, a to people are sick of me saying this but I'll I'll say it. I, when I was in my teenage years in Australia uh, one of the things we did on the weekend we were surfers I lived in a seaside town and we went out with friends and we'd go surfing and I learned more about life and everything out there in the waves of the ocean than I learned anywhere else um, there were so many things I learned. One was, you're not going to have a great ride if you sit on the beach looking at it from afar, wondering. You've got to, it's a participant sport. Yes. This, okay. Right? That's this, a great lesson. The second one yeah. is, when you're out there in the ocean, waves come up and they go down and they always come in cycles. And you start understanding the nature of cycles and you realize the only way you're ever going to catch a wave, you have to be ahead of it, you have to be prepared, and you have to paddle like crazy. Right? Yeah. And I've taken that simple analogy into investments, and it's always done well for me. Exactly. There's nothing complicated about that. It's a very simple, universal truth. You buy low, you sell high, right? Gold, for me, has never let me down. Right. Ever. And yet, I, I know that markets that are extreme highs and extreme lows would be like a surfer out there in tidal waves. You'd be crazy to go into that ocean. Mm -hmm. I like a nice, calm ocean with predictable surf that I can see ahead of time and be prepared for it. And gold ticks all the boxes. Well, gold does. These markets don't. No, These markets don't. are insane. Where do you think we are in this market cycle? Oh, we're, we're way overdrawn for a bear. I mean, it can't. we have been artificially propped up by manipulation by the Federal Reserve and central banks for so long that it has to come down. And the one thing... I guess that everybody knows is the higher something goes up and up and up, the more it hurts when it hits the ground and it falls off. Yeah. And that's going to hurt really hard. I don't know when that is. Uh, I'm not a perma bear at all, but I'm looking at it going, this doesn't feel right. Right. <laughs> this makes no sense. Um, and when it drops and when it goes all the way down, everybody is going to be rushing for the exits. And those that are already prepared and hold their alternative assets, which will likely go up as a result of the down cycle, are the most likely going to win. Right. To me, it's just basic, simple, universal physics. Well, you know, I don't want to put any words in your mouth, so I just want you to say whatever it is that you think. Um, but with the commitment by the Federal Reserve and John Yellen as Treasury Secretary, which is kind of straddling both. Right. Right. Um, you know, the commitment is to like, okay, here's the question. We are being told how fabulous the economy is going to be because of all of this money printing and all of these new stimulus checks that are going out. And I was just talking to my sister who called me this morning and said they looked at their bank account and their bank account was $2,800 richer, right? So they got the stimulus checks, but they also make a very nice living. So she's like, oh, what should we spend this stimulus check on? Which I think is what, you know, now there are definitely some people that really needed it, but there's a lot that's going to those that don't. And they will go into the economy mm -hmm. and they will spend it. Then we're going to hear how great the economy is doing. Look at this. The GDP has grown 10% this quarter. What is your feeling on all of that? Um, I imagine the economy in terms of the money supply like that as, as this sort of picture of uh, lemonade. And what's happened is that it's very weak. 
-hmm. And the way that they're keeping the level up is they keep adding water. Mm -hmm. But the flavor has disappeared to the point where there's no flavor left. It's a great analogy. And and what happens to me is I look at what, what it costs me to go to the supermarket and buy meat or bread or, or milk or whatever. I mean, just the average thing that everybody has to deal with. Well, if your dollar has so much less buying power, it doesn't matter how many of them you have. Exactly. Right? And, I, you know, you can look back in time. Um, if we go back in time, I did this study recently. In 1980, the average price of a, of a house in the United States was $50,000. Mm -hmm. $50,000. In, in 2020, 40 years later, the same, well, not the same house, but the average price of a house is $280,000. So I asked the question, is it not the same house? Are you still not trying to keep the rain off your head and the sun and, and the, you know, you're trying to find shelter and you're looking at the average for these two times and one is 50 and one is 280. So every time I hear somebody say to me, oh, I'm selling my house and I got this amazing price and, you know, I got a million dollars for this house that I bought way back when for like 75K. I'm like, well, what are you going to do with that million dollars? Well, I've got to pay some tax on the capital gain. Or, you know, it was over a certain level. Fair enough. But what are you going to do with it? Well, I'm going to buy a house. Okay, yeah. And what's that house going to cost you? Well, probably a million dollars. <laughs> and so the numbers have changed, but the house is the same. And the problem I see is that in a world where this manipulation, this, this new math, this, this illusionist with the cup and ball tricks that have been going on for so long, the one thing that scares that is gold. Because you cannot fabricate something you can put and hold in your hand. And there's a limited supply. Exactly. Exactly. Right? So, yeah. So that, that's kind of where I'm sitting on it. Well, I, I, I would like you to talk about what's near and dear to your heart, which is the younger generation that's coming up and how all of this really impacts them. Because um, I was on, I was on Meet, uh, Meet Kevin. Kevin the other day, and he commented that my views were so unusual or unique or something like that, right? And I thought, well, I don't really think so. But then it occurred to me that he has a younger demographic, mm -hmm. right? And um, so really, let's take it to the younger demographic because the truth is, is that's our hope. Yeah. You know, they are our hope. Yeah. Um, I think that the first thing that that demographic should understand is that uh, there are forces out to get them that are not uh, covering their best interests. Yes, um, that is so true. Yeah, it is not their parents who are doing everything they possibly could for the benefit of their children. Everyone would. I have a 23-year-old daughter who graduated college, and, and I've been talking to her and, and people of her age group about this very same thing. But what I think is not told to them is, and the, the saddest thing that to me um, is very sad, is that at the age of 18, when their parents had raised them and they finished their high school, and they're sitting down at the kitchen table with a, a document, a, you know, a debt contract, a student mm -hmm. loan agreement to mm -hmm. go to college. Mm -hmm. And before they put pen to paper, these are often, um, and I'll say kids, they're 18-year-olds, um, they're young adults, but they're often in many states not even allowed to go to a bar and buy a beer, yet they're put there in this, in this room with this debt contract and a pen to say, sign on the dotted line and you will have all of the, the middle class treatment and the easy access to the world and you will be that, that person. And then they do that. And they end up with debt that they can't discharge even in bankruptcy. They come at the end of the college without really understanding who they are and what they, their purpose is. They mm -hmm. were hoping that the institution would give them a sample platter for that, but it never really did. No. And the biggest chance they've got of survival is often to go directly. My, my daughter did a business degree, and this was common uh, in the uh, University of Arizona, but to finish the college and become... Uh, an intern at a corporation or an entry level to go immediately from one bubble institution to another bubble institution. And that that is an acceptable norm. And that they're looking at, 
oh, if I make six figure income and I can save all this money and buy a house and pay off my debts and everything. The, the problem is that doesn't happen, but not for everybody. Maybe one in 10, maybe one in five get yeah. that, that treatment. What most people will do, and most parents know this, is that they will guide their child as best they possibly can into that world and then say, okay, kid, you're out of the nest, you're on your own, and the kid falls flat on their face. And at the end of the day, everything's out to get them. And that's scary to me. And as a, as a mm -hmm. parent, as somebody who wants to nurture a child, that is completely not what we would do. We would never right. allow our children to be put in danger like that. And yet this is the world. We do that because it happened to us and it happened to our parents. And maybe back in the 50s and the 60s, it made sense. But in today's world, it doesn't. Yeah, but back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, when, when I was in college and such, I mean, tuitions were a lot lower. Right, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Once the government started backing the student loans, I mean, you can see it. It's a hockey stick. Oh, yeah. Right? And then tuitions and, and costs to go to college have skyrocketed. I don't know. Maybe they've been pulled back a little bit now. But, um, yeah, I see what you're talking about. So... What would be a potential, you know, a part of it is also planning, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you were planning when the child was born and, you know, they have those 529 accounts, but, but you're planning in fiat, right? So that means you're mm -hmm. going to go through that boom and bust cycle. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Just like the retiree, retiree would with their 401k. Right. It's exactly the same. So it, it could make a whole lot more sense to look at what the current college tuition is and then look at the true value of gold, buy enough gold to cover that and then just sell it off mm -hmm. sure. once they're ready to go to college. There's, there's a, a number of ways to do it. Uh, the biggest criticism I would have though is that it's okay for the parent to say to the child, go and spend two years traveling around Europe. Go yeah. And, go and climb the Himalayas. Go to Machu Picchu. Do whatever, you know, go to the Sahara. Do something where you put yourself in a place where you have to find who you are, find your core. That's a great, right? that's great, yes. You will then be armed with the skills, or at least the genesis of the skills, to be able mm -hmm. to take that very same problem-solving pragmatic attitude into the workforce, into your artistic career, into your calling, whatever that may be. If you do that, this is a very common thing that's done in Europe and also in Australia, the gap year. At least what you're doing is you're delaying this inevitable institutionalization in which you don't develop those skills and right. those problems. You, you can't develop pragmatic problem solving skills in a nice comfy house. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> you, you right. Need to be in some form of conflict and, and conflict brings out the pros and cons in life at a heightened level. Mm -hmm. and, and I just, I think people need to do that. With that knowledge and with the chance of understanding where money comes from, how gold works, how oh, finance definitely. works. Yeah. You work in a bar somewhere in Tokyo because you've got to to be able to keep your backpacking year going. You learn very quickly about economics. You might not get that with the credit card down at the Best Buy store. <laughs> exactly. That's a really good point. Of course, I'm from here and I know a lot of parents are like, oh, if they take two years off, they're never going to go back, which may or may not happen. You know, not everybody needs to go to college. Yeah. I, well, we have to be honest with ourselves and realize some basic statistics. 65% of all college graduates choose a path in college that they no, do not use as a career. 65%. 65%. Wow. I didn't Se realize it was that high. 78% yeah. according to Forbes magazine of people with uh, up to a hundred thousand dollars of annual income are living paycheck to paycheck. Yes. Right. Yes. We're we are in an overconsumption, underproduction economy and how can you ever be producing at that your optimum level if you're doing something that isn't your calling? Right. Oh, that's true. I feel so blessed that I get to do my calling because right. You spend too much time at it not exactly. to. So, yeah. Exactly. And I, and I think it's healthy to question norms. It's oh, healthy I do to. Too. It's, it's what we would, um, in, in business, we celebrate the concept of due diligence, right? Research something and think about it before you commit. Yes. 
Our kids don't do that. No. No, and yet we celebrate this as a norm, and we need to we need to bring that into this whole discussion. So, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. I think contrarianism is a way for people to be able to see through the static and the right. dust and see what things truly are. And if you understand, do the polar opposite of what the herd is doing, you'll do just great. You'll do just great. <laughs> oh, I, I absolutely agree with that. Because even if you're on a boat, it's going to tip over if yeah. everybody's just on one side. Absolutely. So that's probably not where you want to be. And, you know, then something else in that same age group is the Reddit rebellion and mm -hmm. Robin Hood and the rise of the gamification of the stock market. And I can tell you from my studies that when the masses, the naive masses start to get involved in those things, it's an indication that we're somewhere near the end of it. Mm -hmm. But how, you know, I mean, I can see, I can, I don't know how much of a financial education they're really getting on Robin Hood, but what do you think about it? What do you think about it? I love video games, like anybody, and, and having a, had a career in building systems, I understand that systems have rules and that we're all data points in a system, and if you move that way, something happens, and if you go that way, something happens. And what's happened is our, our, what our markets have turned into these massive collective data centers on Wall Street. Yes. And all of a sudden, the computers are calling the shots, yes. and the humans are sitting back watching it all from afar on a on a big screen with charts. These guys saw a crack in the system. They saw something that was being exploited and realized if you if you do what we would, for lack of a better term, hack it, you can do this sort of thing on mass and you can do something the system was never designed to accept and you can turn it on its end. You mm -hmm. can take it uh, Which something- Which is a good thing, really. It is, it proves that the system is not mature enough yet. The problem is that I see is that if all of our world and all of our lives are about us being data points in somebody else's system, we are chess pieces on their chessboard. Exactly. And well, and that's where we're going with the whole system too, the exactly. full surveillance system, everything digitized. Right. Right. And we are human beings. We have a left and a right side of our brain. We might have a left pragmatic problem solving mathematical logical side, but we have a, an artistic human warmth feeling uh, soulful side mm -hmm. and we don't pay enough respect to either we think that the world is all about the left side of the brain the pragmatic system and how we as mm -hmm. data points can manipulate it and if we do all of this if we do it all on mass we can all become wealthy and rich beyond wildest dreams but at the end of the day we get one life to live and if you're not living that to your fullest and all you're doing is spending your time sitting behind a computer watching other people sitting behind a computer doing things, that scares me. Uh, it makes me nervous too. I mean, I, I watch my grandkids and they're, in my opinion, they are on that computer way too much because a lot of these things are specifically designed to get you addicted, mm -hmm. right? Oh, absolutely. So how does that, you know, kind of fit in? What can, what can we do, I mean, as a grandparent, frankly, there's really not a whole lot that we can do other than saying, okay, when you're at my house, there's so much to do here. You leave your computers in the car. Right. 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 But, I mean, what could we, what should we be doing? Turn everything off. Go out into the sunshine. Plant some garden. Do things that with nature. Oh. Right? right? And then all of a sudden, you will find balance. <laughs> well, I agree with that. And so oh my gosh. we brought <laughs> from our gardens this morning, look at this beautiful pro produce for you, because I'm there so you glad are. that you're here. There you but are. I, you know, I agree with it because going in and getting your hands dirty and being out in nature is fabulous. But if these kids are addicted to that, I mean, how can you prevent that? I mean, that's, that's the big concern, really. They, they, they have to realize one thing. They get one shot at this. Don't screw it up, right? Don't, you can make bad decisions. You can learn from falling down. We all have to do that. But don't waste time. It's the only resource we have a finite amount of. And, and we, we could have an infinite amount of money out there, but we have a finite amount of time. And if you do not respect it, it will bite you back. Um, the one thing I would say to a, a, a somebody in that demographic, 
The worst thing in the world that you can ever have is that you get to the age of, say, 50, maybe 60, and you look back and you have regret. Oh, yeah. Because regret will follow you until the day you die. Yeah. (laughs) And it gets worse and worse and worse as you get older. Because if you regret not doing something, or you regret not involving yourself in some sort of... Don't leave things in life to being bucket lists. Yeah. I mean, that's insane. Why would you want to do that when you've got a bad back and a bad, bad hip? Exactly. <laughs> I agree and with you now. on that one. Yeah, I, yeah and, and get out there because there's only so much you're going to learn by sitting in front of a computer, but so much more that you can learn about who you are and what you want mm-hmm. if you just go out there and try things and fail. You know, you fail up, right? right? Absolutely. Right? You, you never regret, you know, when I look on my life, are there things that I might change? Mm, yeah, maybe a couple things. Sure. Uh, but I don't have any regrets. Be, I only, You only regret what you didn't do. Right, exactly. Right? What you were too nervous to do. And I did have one regret, actually, but then being in front of the camera and doing what I do now has filled that. Ah. Because when, when I was, when I was young, okay, you guys, I'll tell you something. <laughs> All right. But when I was very young, I was in theater, right? Mm-hmm. And, but I didn't have the confidence after I got out of college, I didn't have the confidence to go and test it. Mm-hmm. And that was always a, a regret that I had. You know, I got married, I had babies, and, you know, I mean, life happens. Right. Uh, but, because I get to do this with all of you guys, that really, yeah. I don't think I was supposed to do that. I think I was supposed to do well, that. Look, and thank God you do this because more people need to hear the truth about things. Yes. And, and look, I understand it's complicated, right? You have a life spent in understanding the complexities of this. And it's designed to be. Because you can't hide bad things in, in transparency, right? Right. Life has a sense of, of uh, showing things good and bad for what they, what they are. But you can hide things behind the cup and the ball and over here. And, and we need more people like you out there exposing and what's you. going on. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, and really talking to the younger generation because, honestly, I love getting older. I mean, what we've gotten to see in our lifetime is phenomenal. And Absolutely. it's not done yet. No. But, you know, you can say, I was there. I was there in 1971 when they transitioned from a gold standard to a debt-based standard. I was there in 1986 when we started all of the talk about globalization. Mm-hmm. And in 1987, mm-hmm. on Black Monday, when the markets imploded. You know, so... You, you live a life and you have those experiences, but if you keep your life really too narrow, you're only focused in this one area. You're just, you know, on your, on your gaming computer or you're just on your laptop and you don't go out and explore and experience and, you know, and test, test yourself. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know. I mean, the, the, the best game in the world out there is to understand how to have relationships with people and how to embrace society and, and contribute something that makes it better. Yes. That, to me, is Contribution. Yeah. 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 But it's like, like I said, you know, the guy sitting on the beach looking at the waves and watching everybody else enjoying themselves out there. You've got to get off that beach and go and get wet. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I agree with you. We, w- we went to Hawaii. And a few years ago, and my niece lives there, so she she lives on Maui, so she came, right? And one thing I always wanted to do, because, of course, it was, a, a, you know, sharks, I was afraid of sharks, right? Okay, sure. Okay, so I decided that I wanted to go, you know, swimming out in the ocean, and we did that. I did that with my niece, nobody else, well, Megan couldn't go because she had something else to do, and nobody else wanted to go. But my niece is a big scuba diver, ah. and she's so she was like, she's like, I'll go with you, Aunt Lynn, and we went. And I'll tell you what, sliding off that pontoon into just this huge ocean, <laughs> it was exhilarating. It was. I'm not going to say I wasn't a little bit nervous about it because, right. of course, you know, we have these 
unfounded fears or whatever. But I cherish that experience so much because I overcame my fears. Right. Right. right? I mean, that's really what it is. You have to test yourself. Oh, okay. I have this limitation that I put on myself. Now go test that, break through it. And what do you learn about yourself from that? Exactly. Exactly. That's the greatest game out there. <laughs> oh, it really is. It yeah. really is. This has been like, this has really been fun. Good. It's so nice. It feels more normal. Yeah. Right? It yeah. feels a lot more normal. I know Edgar's there smiling and <laughs> nodding his head. We're all living in Zoom fatigue. We're oh, really we are. And, you know, we need the interaction. And, you know, who knows if this isn't really part of just us giving up control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. it's. Oh, I wonder about that sometimes. I do. I, I do think we're going to get back to some form of regularity again. And, and for me, uh, we travel a lot. And I spend probably, I think the last few years, probably four to five months of each year has been overseas uh, at some in some other country somewhere. And I really miss that. Yeah. That's hard. It is. It is. Yeah. But, you know, we, we're going to get back to it, and eventually those countries will want us to go visit them again, and we'll be fine. I'm I'm sure. But this has been great. Thank you so much for coming Anytime. in. Anytime. I would like you, if there's anything else that you want to talk about, impart any message, I how to get a hold of you, how oh, to okay. find your work, all, right, all well, of that. Um, if anybody's interested in my ramblings on these subjects, um, <laughs> I think go, they're great ramblings. Okay, thank you. They can go over to beunconstrained.com. That's my website. I have a podcast. I produce uh, an episode once a week, and and we have a sister podcast as well for our Patreon supporters as well. But uh, they can find everything over there at that website. And uh, we have all of the links below, and also on our blog as well. Great. Yeah, that's wonderful. So yeah, we welcome all comers. Um, you don't have to come over to our site with a bundle of money or anything like that. We're all about trying to find, uh, to build a community, uh, mm -hmm, to try to mm -hmm. find a way to actually see through the mist and the illusions that are going on in regular people's lives without them having to devote an enormous amount of their time to do it. So uh, it's going very well, and I'm very happy to hear so many of the success stories of some of our, of our community that are doing amazing things. Uh, so I welcome everybody to come over there. That's excellent. And, you know, you just heard this conversation, which I think this was a really nice relax. This was fun. I Good. enjoyed it so Good. much. We have to do it now that you're here. You'll have to come to the farm. Okay. So you got the produce. You can yeah. pick it yourself. Okay. <laughs> Bring shoes can be ho hosed off. We'll let you go in the chicken yard and gather your own eggs. Oh, man. <laughs> My wife will love that. She's a, a absolute. Her father was an agricultural a professor of agricultural science in Australia oh. uh, and he had a small holding farm which actually was quite large and grew everything there and unfortunately he passed away but before that I had the pleasure of spending so much time with him and at the farm and understanding the nature of, of organic uh, vegetable growing and everything that is fascinating um, and I would encourage anybody who got the opportunity to do that it's great. oh absolutely actually since food becomes the biggest issue for people during these reset transitions, and I, I should ask you before we before we sign off too, did you notice what happened in Venezuela recently with I, the changing of the currency? Yes, I, I saw the result of the changing of the currency and what it did to their markets. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, I mean the market went boom, right. and then gold went boom, and so did silver, yeah. boom. Okay, so that that proves exactly what we were talking about. I just did a piece on that yesterday. Right. So people can go in and look at all the charts and they can go in and do their own due diligence yeah. themselves with all of the links. But all yeah. Things that go up must come down. <laughs> yeah. A tree does not grow. There you go. <laughs> to the to the sky. It can go pretty tall, but yeah, what goes up must come down. So at any rate, I was on with Meet Kevin. The link in the inter is in the uh, description at the interview. And was it yesterday that Danielle on Stansbury Research was released? I think it was yesterday or the now. day before. It's out now. It's out now. So you definitely want to go and see that one. Uh, and 
on Friday, I'm going to be a speaker on MM Steel Club's online conference, Steel Metals and Mining Week. And I'm going to be specifically talking about how gold and silver perform during currency resets. This is a really critical thing for everybody to understand because that's what we're doing right now. Right. You know, we've already started that. Next week, I'll be on with Neil McCoy Ward on Tuesday. And on April 1st, I'll be with Mark Moss. So those are two new channels for us. So, and you guys know, I always like the new channels too, because you never know what anybody's going to ask you. So it's very fun. If you like this, and I hope you did, because I did, give us a thumbs up. Make sure that you share and share with those in your life that, that you care about and love and the younger generation, because that is, they are our hope. Absolutely. They are our hope. So until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.